Badminton world champion Lo Kian Yu telling The Straits Times he's proud to be a history maker for Singapore. More people can now travel with the land VTL between Singapore and JB extending to citizens of both countries. And in our Smart Parenting segment today, tips on how to prepare younger children for their COVID-19 jabs. You're watching The Big Story, I'm Olivia Quay. 5.30pm here in Singapore and a wonderful start to the week thanks to Singapore shuttler Lo Kian Yu who's crowned the badminton world champion. If you didn't stay up for last night's final in Spain, here's match point against India's Srikanth Kidambi. It's in, it's way in and Lo Kian Yu of Singapore becomes the world champion. An amazing win capping off Kian Yu's run at the World Championships, which began with an upset over world number one Victor Axelsson in the opening round. And halfway around the world, Kian Yu's triumph was watched by his family. Yeah. 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 On the left, Kian Yu's parents and brother celebrating in their home in Penang. And on the right, his other brother in the collared shirt witnessing the moment and going bonkers with his friends in Singapore. Kian Yu spoke to our sports correspondent, David Lee, on what being world champion means for him. I think this medal here, um, there's a lot of meaning to it. Like All my sacrifices all along, I've been having like all this journey in the career or uh, I mean it's not easy it's a very long long journey la. so I'm glad that this finally happened and yeah I'm glad that I actually won this medal and of course it's also a very good thing for Singapore because um, yeah it's, it means that Singapore as a small nation we, we could we could win such a big at such a big event um, a world championship medal so yeah um, I'm happy to to be the one that do that to create the history what do you think you did right this past week and for the matter the past few months and what do you think you still need to improve on uh, as we move towards Paris 2024 I mean fitness mental and of course consistency that's what I've been trying to work on and that's what I'm going to continue to work on because to stay at the top is not easy. It's going to take a lot of consistency and I need to continue work on that in order to be even better than I am right now. And what went right this week or in the past few months? What went right, you know, that you went on such a sensational run? Uh, I mean, I trained with Victor for a month and I saw how he trained, how focused he was, how consistent he was. And after that, I just try to bring it in my own game and um, as I played some competition that I was up and down yeah I screw up a few times but I try my best to learn from it so yeah I just keep trying to uh, really be better than the match yesterday and uh, yeah just keep going and just never give up you are coming back to Singapore soon what is the first thing you will do when you reach Singapore or you want to do? Uh, I, I just want to lie on my own bed after showering, of course. Yeah, I miss my bed. <laughs> you can watch the full interview on straightstimes.com. Sports correspondent David Lee is here to tell us more about Kian Yu. So, David, he's the world champion, about to face more challenges with a target on his back. We've just seen a little bit of your interview with Kian Yu. You've spoken with him several times before that. What's your impression of him? Is he mentally ready to take all of that on? Right, so Ken Yu is a great badminton player as we all we have all seen. And he's also a great person as well. He's happy-go-lucky, down to earth, and has shown great courage and calmness on the court over the past few months. So let me give you two examples. So 
he rolled his ankle actually in, in the quarterfinal win over Pranoy and bounced back to win his semifinal against Antonsen. And after that, he actually couldn't walk. He was on a wheelchair and his physio spent three hours from 10.30 to 1.30 in the morning trying to patch him up for the final. And he went out there and, and, and won the World Championship final. So understandably, the Singapore Badminton Association wanted to get him out uh, on the first flight back to assess his condition and give him the necessary treatment and, and upgraded him to business class. His first reaction was not to revel in his new, new status and, and the perks, but to ask if the same could be done for his coach and his physio. This is the measure of the man. Is, is he mentally ready to take on his new status as world champion and have everybody try to beat him? Only time will tell. It won't be easy. Top players will, will no longer take him lightly. Nobody will. And the younger ones will aim to beat him, just like he aimed to beat the likes of Victor Exelsen and Kento Momota before. And, and people will now want to beat him so that they can say, hey, I beat a world champion. So like I said, it, it won't be easy, but this guy specializes in delivering the seemingly impossible. So yeah, let's see. Well, fingers crossed for Kian Yu. So let's talk about his style of play. You know, what is it about the way he plays that has uh, seen him beat the world numbers one and two and other higher ranked opponents as well, David? Right. He's, he's fast. He's lightning fast. Uh, a Danish player, Hans Christian Wittinghus, put it this way. In badminton, there's fast, there's ginting fast, referring to an Indonesian player, and then there's Lokian Yu fast. So, so that's how fast he is and how high regard uh, the other players uh, hold him. And, and while his smashes have always been his strength, he has now been able to add strong defense to his capabilities as well. Plus, he has a fearlessness about him. That calmness and courage I talked about earlier, you know, when he faces a high-ranked player, it's not like he's already beaten by his opponent's reputation, but he genuinely believes he stands a chance against anybody out there. And even when he's in a disadvantage, disadvantageous situation, like he was in the final, he was 9-3 down in the first game, 18-16 down in the second game, he doesn't panic. He finds solutions. And when he's up by big margin, he doesn't let up, he goes for the kill. And when you put all of these attributes together, he's pretty much unbeatable when he's at his best, at least for now, because nobody seems to have an answer on how to overcome him. Well, David, as you know, it's not just about the athlete uh, himself, right? How can Kian Yu improve his support system moving forward? And what can our local sports bodies do in that area? Right, I think the Singapore Badminton Association and Singapore Sport Institute need to work together to carefully chart his program for the next three years if he is to contend for a medal at the 2024 Paris Olympics. I've said before, they need to be careful with the punishing calendar and his aggressive all-out style of play. It's mind-boggling to think how he has kept this up for every match this past week at the World Championship. But from now to the next Olympics, it's 32 months that we are talking about. That means managing which and how many tournaments he plays in and ensuring he gets proper recovery from every competition and from any niggling injury. Any kind of support he needs, physical fitness, mental health, opponent analysis, or even upgrading his spec scholarship tier. I think they should pull out all the stops to support our world champion's quest to achieve more sporting glory for Singapore. Well said. That was sports correspondent David Lee. Also in the news, a teenager caught on video doing a backflip inside the white rhino enclosure at the Singapore Zoo will undergo reformative training for at least a year. Ralph Wee Ikai was sentenced today after pleading guilty last month to eight charges for other incidents as well, including killing a frog on a foosball table. The 19-year-old will be detained in a centre and made to follow a strict regimen that includes foot drills and counselling. 
On the COVID-19 front, just in time for the holidays, more people can now use the vaccinated travel lane via the causeway. From today, the expanded land VTL allows citizens of Singapore and Malaysia to travel between both countries. Previously, travellers had to be citizens, permanent residents or long-term pass holders of the country that they were entering. Under current rules, all travellers entering Singapore will have to take daily tests for seven days, while those entering Malaysia will be subject to daily tests for six days. Over in Europe, countries are battling a huge wave of Omicron infections with the Netherlands already going into a strict lockdown until at least mid-January. The UK has not ruled out a circuit breaker or new restrictions before Christmas as shoppers in London rush to buy presents on the final weekend ahead of the holiday. The UK's health minister is saying there are no guarantees in this pandemic and everything has to be kept under review. Meanwhile, Italy is watching what happens in the UK and considering a package of new measures to slow the surge in cases. Possible options include mandating masks outdoors and requiring vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals to take COVID-19 tests to access large events. In this week's Smart Parenting segment, how do parents feel about vaccinating their kids against COVID-19? Well, bookings for children aged 5 to 11 are set to begin this week if supplies arrive as scheduled. We'll take a look at the concerns and issues parents have about the COVID-19 vaccine for their kids and get the answers from the experts as well. Education correspondent Amelia Ting is with me now. Amelia, so we know this is not an easy decision for some parents to make. What are some of the key questions that they have about vaccinating their children against COVID-19? Yeah, so some parents um, are concerned uh, because the children are younger and um, concerned about the safety of the vaccine and if there will be any adverse reactions or side effects that could show up. Um, just a few days ago, we heard from the US CDC and we, we see reports of um, eight cases of myocarditis or a type of heart inflama uh, inflammation in children aged 5 to 11 who received the Pfizer vaccine. And I see parents concerned about this news, this update, and they're discussing it online and offline. Um, this morning, I spoke to Dr. Janil. He is the Senior Minister of State for Health and is also a medical doctor. I posed these, some of these questions and these concerns to him, um, and in particular, what these eight cases of heart inflammation mean. And this is what he said. The cases that you're, that you're referring to, I think, are from um, a US CDC report. Um, and that report looked at over 7 million doses administered. So this is not the trial, it's the report after the trial. Um, and so in a way, it's an example of just how closely we're monitoring this. 7 million doses in the 5 to 11 age group. And there were eight cases, but they were all mild. And that's the key thing. They were all mild. Whereas we know that with COVID-19 infection, um, we have had cases uh, in Singapore, not, not of, the, not of, the, um, of, of uh, the same nature of the myocarditis in this age group, but of the uh, multi- uh, system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC, and some of those children needed ICU care. Uh, and so what we're trying to protect ch the children from um, is from getting these severe infection uh, related outcomes. Well, you can watch Amelia's full interview with Dr. Janil over at straightstimes.com. Well, Amelia, let's go on to another question. You know, some parents may also be wondering how best to prepare their kids uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine before and after the jab. So what are some tips to help these parents? So I've spoken to some pediatricians about what parents can do. And the first thing that a lot of doctors say is to um, give children a few days notice so that they can prepare themselves and also um, spend some time asking questions about the vaccination and the procedure and why they are doing this in the first place. So explain to your kids you know, what um, this vaccination means and why they're doing it you know, to, to protect themselves against COVID. Um, and knowing what to expect will also help to make the process on the day itself a bit smoother. And as one doctor pointed out, you know, an unpleasant experience um, on the first dose may make the second one a bit more difficult. Um, for children who are a bit more fearful, you know, scared of needles, uh, it's quite a common fear. 
um, parents could let them bring along maybe a comfort item or you know a familiar stuffed toy to or distract them even by letting them watch a video uh, during the jam. You could also um, talk sit down and talk to your kids about you know your own vaccination experience and remind them that they have gone through uh, similar immunizations when they were younger even if they don't remember it. And for um, one doctor also said that you could um, numb the area, the injection site, you know, with some cooler pack or some ice. Uh, it could be helpful and then, you know, bring your kids for some reward or some small treat after the jab. The jab that may also work. And of course, after the, the jab, um, you have to watch out for any side effects. Um, immediate allergic reactions are usually detectable during the first 30 minutes um, after the, the jab. But other symptoms like tightness, muscle ache, possible fever, those may come later, similar to what the adults have experienced. Anything um, that is a bit more worrisome, like a per persistent chest pain, fever or breathlessness for more than three days, this should be brought to the doctor's attention. Great tips there, Amelia. So I have a bit of a more personal question for you. You are a mom of two and the older kid uh, just turned five years old. So on the cusp of that new age group that's allowed to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So do some parents of younger children especially have particular concerns about the vaccine? Uh, yes, definitely. I think some parents of younger kids like mine a bit more cautious about the vaccine because you know our kids are at the border in terms of the age and initially when I started hearing news about the vaccine being rolled out and approved uh, for this 5 to 11 age group I thought you know is there anything magical about this age 5 that makes them eligible for the vaccine you know why not 4 why not why stop at 5 um, so I've spoken to some doctors and found out that in a sense it's an arbitrary cutoff uh, the age windows are based on what the vaccine companies have studied. It's based on the data um, that we have so far, based on what the trials have done and proven. So um, as Dr. Janil also said that, you know, vaccines are usually rolled out uh, in this way. Uh, you start first with the adults and then you go on to the children and younger children after that. So in a sense, it should be reassuring uh, to know that we are only vaccinating the children by age batches after studies have been done um, accordingly to show that it is safe and effective uh, for different age groups of children. So uh, there are also now trials actually going on for vaccines in the zero to four age group to see if it works for them and gives them significant protection. So if that uh, works out, we may actually be immunizing our younger kids younger than, than five. Thank you so much, Amelia. That was education correspondent Amelia Ting. You can, of course, read more on how parents of younger children especially can prepare them for their COVID-19 vaccination on str.sg forward slash smart parenting. You can also visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Kuei. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.